Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with RSU-TV at Roger State University in Oklahoma. Today we are chatting with Keith Green, Operations Coordinator of the Muscogee Creek Nation Reintegration Program, and Kristen Harlan, Executive Director of the Criminal Justice and Mercy Ministries. They have generously agreed to share some of their experience with us. I'd like to thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. Reintegration is such an important, important thing that we do not do well in society. We just have not done it well. We've incarcerated people. We've been great at incarcerating people, putting people into jail. But taking people out of the criminal justice system and moving them back into a place where they have respect for themselves, where they receive respect from society, where they can hold a job, where they can be successful, we've done that very poorly. And you are actually here to heal that. Let's talk a little bit about the different work that you do to integrate people in your communities. And let's start with you, Keith. Talk a little bit about what you do at the Muscogee Creek uh, Nation. We've been established for 16 years within our program. Uh, when we initially started the program, we were had very little funding through the tribe. It was really not probably a popular decision amongst the tribe by doing reentry services. Dealing with uh, incarcerated citizens is is not always the most popular thing to do. Sixteen years later, we've built a seven million dollar facility with a thirty six bed transitional living facility, and uh, we have an on site counselor, we have on site attorney, and twenty five employees that go give back to our our clients. Uh, one of the things that we are able to do is house and feed and clothe immediately upon release. Our program is designed that you have to be a convicted felon. You have to have a, a DOC number. Once you get released, you can come through our program. Like I said, we can, we can help you with the necessities right from the very start. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we are able to do now is is just go out there and help with their education and their driver's license reinstatement, uh, helping them with gainful employment. Some of the things that are very hard to do uh, with a with a felony background, and some of the barriers that that people have to cross to to get to it are some of the things that we try to target to make their lives simpler and better. And and as as you talk with people, what are those preconceptions that you find sometimes that you're trying to break down? Because you're you're acting as an ambassador, and then your clients, these convicted felons who wish to reintegrate, they become ambassadors in their own right. You know, it's like we explained to them today. Uh, they're going to get released. They're going to come back into your communities. Maybe your neighbor. You don't know. Right. That's the biggest thing about it. But at least with our program, when they come through our program, we have a very good regiment set up. Um, our clients are, are geared toward different things. We have a curfew that they have to be back on site and then in their house by 10 o'clock at night. Okay, We do random drug tests, and when I say random, it's a random date. It's not a random person. When we drug test, we drug test everybody there. It could be one or two th times a week. It could be once every other week, but the, the dates are random. We have a company that comes in and runs drug dogs through our facilities. We do alcohol testing. It's not just a free-for-all to where they come out and they're free to do whatever. They are on federally tribal property. Um, but what they're given is a second chance. They're given an opportunity. Right. Yeah, they're not given a, a handout. We prefer to say a hand up because a lot of times, like you stated, that our clients would be released with a $50 check and no way to cash it because they lost their ID when they was incarcerated. So once they come through our program, we're able to give them a handout and a next step you know, most people, I can't say most, but a lot of people that has been incarcerated has ruined a lot of relationships along the way due to incarceration. Right. Uh, a lot of family members that may have been there in the past aren't there now, or a lot of friends that they got in trouble with that are either locked up with them or, or something else. So a lot of times they don't have anybody to count on. They don't have anybody to be there for them. And that's something that's really good about our program. And it helps us to get to people that want to change. Nobody that comes through our program is court ordered to be there. They don't have to be there. They're there because they want to be there. Not saying that every single one of them are successful, but we have a very good success rate. Uh, up until the housing units were built, our recidivism rate was about 83, 84%. We were doing extremely well and keeping a lot of people from going back. Uh, since our, our 
residents have been built. It's been within the last two and a half years. We haven't really had measurable data to go out there and look and see how successful would it Something that I had a discussion with a gentleman on the way up here of how do you measure success in, in this area? And do you do it because they've got their first car and they're paying for it or do they have a job or do they have a house they're paying for on their own? Success is, is measured in a lot of different ways in this area. And Kristen, talk a little bit about your program. So at Criminal Justice and Mercy Ministries, CJAM for short, we have transitional homes called Exodus Houses, and they're in Oklahoma City and in the Tulsa area, and we take people coming immediately out of prison. They cannot go back to their home community first, um, and then we put them inside an apartment community. They each have their own apartment that's fully furnished. They have sponsors who wrap around them um, in a family of faith so that that way they have someone that they can depend on. We have found that if you have one person who um, you can rely on and you also have gainful employment, you're less likely to go back to prison. We're a six to nine month program. Um, any rent that is paid is actually put into a savings account so that that way whenever they leave, they are able to pay the deposits that are gonna be due for rent wherever they're going. Our success rate uh, recidivism is 1.7%, meaning that 98.3 do not return to prison. Um, we've been able to track that in the 20 years that we've been in existence, and it is because we have the sponsorships, the gainful employment, we help get the driver's license back immediately, get cars. That is something that whenever you mentioned we're just not doing well in the state of Oklahoma, I was actually glad to see that with the commutations, Department of Corrections is making sure that people are getting their driver's license now before they're getting out, which is huge here in the state of Oklahoma. So we are just a transitional program that are just meeting the needs of people across the state. Talk a little bit about the, the meaning, and, and perhaps you can summarize what has happened recently in Oklahoma, because Oklahoma had one of the nation's highest incarceration rates, and now there, there's been a real shift, and perhaps a shift in mentality. We'll have to see how this unfolds. Uh, but, talk, but talk a little bit from, from each of your perspectives about uh, the the recent uh, activity. Perhaps you could describe it. Uh, Kristen, you want to describe initial, initially what, what has just happened? So with the commutation, it came out of House Bill 1269, which backdated um, 780 and 781, which were the simple possession charges are no longer felonies in the state of Oklahoma. They're misdemeanors. Simple possession of? Of marijuana, of drugs. Um, so that used to be a felony here in the state of Oklahoma, right. where it's been misdemeanors for years in other places. And so the commutation took all of those and simple drug possession charges, people were actually able to apply to get out early and they let out um, a sizable amount of people November 4th. Our program actually welcomed people with open arms and I know yours did too. Um, so that that way people had a, not just a chance to make it, but a better leg up to be able to go through transition because it was open the doors, let people out. So all of our transitional homes across the state stepped up made sure people had a place to go and resources so they weren't just released back into the same environment, but that they had skills um, to be able to go back to their communities. And what did it mean for, for your communities? We did see a, a small influx. It wasn't mm -hmm. near as big as what we anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, releasing four to 500 inmates, uh, we figured that we would see a, a huge influx. We have saw quite a few come in over the last couple weeks, week and a half, since they were, re were released. Uh, the biggest thing about it is, you know, is is just like she said, it, it's been such a huge problem in the state of Oklahoma. Right. I, I mean, I know there for a while, for 18 years straight, we incarcerated more females than any other state in the, in the nation. And and that's a, that's a lot of females. And, and now we're the number one state of incarceration for men as well. So there, the, the problem is there, it exists. And uh, through partnerships, whether it be you know in and around our area or throughout the state, uh, we try not to hide anything that we do because our adult program is geared toward just being able to help Creek citizens. So we want everybody to know how we do what we do because everybody needs this kind of assistance. In terms of the work that you do, you, you also, you have this nine month program. Talk a little bit about how that that uh, program unfolds, Kristen. When somebody comes in, you have this, this sort of nine month piece, but there are different segments, there are different experiential uh, pieces that you're graduating into a time when you're going to walk out that door and exit the program. Right. 
So whenever a person comes in, we automatically we're trying to find a job for right. each person. Uh, job is key. The most important thing gainful is employment, that gainful employment is that job. Um, so they get their job. They're required to go to three meetings a week. So that would be Celebrate Recovery, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, and connect with a sponsor for someone to walk along that path with them. We also do random drug tests. We have a curfew, making sure that they're accountable. Um, and then they start going through parenting classes. They start going through um, anger management. They start going through financial management, budgeting. And they take all of these classes until the end whenever it's time for them to go at about nine months. And there's a lot in common here. We're talking yes, about absolutely. curfew, absolutely. anger management, uh, uh, talk therapy, group therapy. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to call it therapy. We can just call it talking about, you know, coming together and... Well, group group meetings in the community, I would say, are one of our most important times of the week. They're on Tuesday nights. And we have facilitators who come in to facilitate. And it's understanding the community because we've put people who were in prison and now we're putting them in a community and it's how do we live in society? How do we get along? But what problems are we also facing? Because they're all facing the same problems. Uh, what is your budget, uh, Keith? And, and how many people are involved and, uh, and what kind of partners do you have? Honestly, right now, I mean, our, our budget is, is a, a good budget. I can't give you the exact numbers of what we're dealing with, but we have a large operating budget that we deal with. Uh, Early on, like I said, we had four employees. Now we have 25 on staff. Right. Uh, we're managed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We don't ever close with having people housed on our facility. We have to have people there. Uh, you know, our future, our plans right now, we do, uh, we've do. we partnered up with a career tech and uh, are offering a welding school that we have on site uh, within our program. So that's been a, a gainful thing for us. So what we've done is if, we, if we, we've graduated approximately 34, 35 people through our welding class throughout the last four months. Uh, I'm not saying they've all gone on to become welders, but they are certified welders and, and, became, and can, can get into that field. Uh, we have another class that we're hoping to start back up in January, a welding class. And then after that, we're going to try to get into something different other than welding. The thing about it is, is we had to fi find defender friendly fields. Right, right. And for you, uh, what is the scale of your operation, the number of people? The scale of our operation is we are able to help um, around 100 people each year in our transitional mm -hmm. homes. We're able to help about 7,000 through our redemption missions. Mm -hmm. And through our camps, it's about 120. Um, our budget is about 600,000, with 200 being just our Exodus houses. Um, we are a volunteer organization, so there are eight employees that house all of these different, um, we're basically facilitators for our volunteers. Um, there's eight of us with over 600 volunteers across the state in every prison and in all of our programs working each, each day to make sure that we're successful in what we do. Keith Green of the Muscogee Creek Nation Reintegration Program and Kristen Harlan of the Criminal Justice and Mercy Ministries. Thank you so much for sharing these stories with us, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Thank for you. Us.